All righty. So, and then today for sustainable transportation, we're going to be talking about how to get around sustainably, electric vehicles, public transportation, um, bicycle and pedestrian options, and also our legacy trail. And I'll be sending out these slides after the class too. So take notes if you want, but you will be getting all of this information. Uh, so today I have a wonderful team of panelists. Um, my name is Aaliyah Garrett and I'm the Sustainability Outreach Coordinator at Sarasota County Extension. And I'll let uh, Miranda introduce herself and then you can go to Patrick um, and then Catherine. Good afternoon. My name is Miranda Lansdale, and I am the Marketing and Communications Coordinator with Breeze Transit for Sarasota County. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Patrick Louie. I'm the Bicycle Protection and Trails Coordinator. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about what I do here at the county when it's uh, uh, my turn up on the podium here. But uh, for now, I'll pass it over to Catherine. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Wunderlich. I'm the trails manager for the Legacy Trail, and I'm filling in for Megan Idell, who's the natural areas trails manager. And unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, so you get to see my shining face today. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you all so much. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So for our sustainability program, we've been around since 2002, which is truly amazing. We were actually the first sustainability program in Florida, our county program, and the seventh in the nation. So we've had a really longstanding commitment to sustainability in our county. And just so we know, uh, the definition of sustainability is uh, meeting the needs of the present without sacrificing the future's ability to meet their own needs. And that's what our sustainability resolution um, says. We just use that general definition um, that's internationally recognized. And a lot of the times people think that sustainability is just that environmental pillar, but it really is more holistic than that. It's about our sustainable society and sustainable economy. So we often refer to it as people, planet, and prosperity. Um, so for our program, we do have a lot of grants that we manage. Um, we have about $7 million since 2010. A lot of them are focused on energy and water efficiency. We have an energy equity program um, through our energy upgrade where we do retrofits and low income housing to help people save money on their utility bills, but also to conserve precious resources. Um, so we have tons of different programs and ways to plug in with our office. We are hosting another annual sustainable communities workshop this year. So if you're interested, it's on November 7th. Um, we do a lot with climate and resiliency, waste reduction, and we have tons of different classes that are listed over here on the right. So there's a lot of opportunities to join us. So what is sustainable transportation? It refers to low and zero emission, energy efficient, affordable modes of transport, including electric and alternative fuel vehicles, as well as domestic fuels. So there's a lot of benefits that go into this. We'll talk about some more of them on later slides, uh, but namely cost savings on fuel and vehicles, reduced carbon emissions, and improved accessibility to reliable, affordable transportation options. So why is it important? According to the Environmental Protection Agency, transportation is the largest emitter of climate pollution or greenhouse gases. And we just did a priority climate action plan uh, this year. And the results of that shows that about half, 49% of our community climate pollution or air pollution comes from transportation specifically. Um, so using sustainable transportation can really help reduce air and climate pollution by driving green and taking all of those sustainable transportation options that we're going to talk about today. So why should you go electric? They're fun to drive. We have an electric vehicle at our office and I swear it's super smooth. It's quiet. I don't have to stop at the gas station and fill it up after the fact. Lower maintenance costs, um, reduction in foreign oil, reducing tailpipe and life cycle emissions. Reducing emissions is so important. It's really helping um, with air quality and reducing the impacts of our changing climate. So lots of good benefits there. Uh, again, really just wanna stress that it's so quiet. I was just saying uh, to Catherine, the older I get, louder noises just bother me so deeply. So driving around the electric vehicle is just super nice. Um, 
and you feel cool cutting edge technology there's that stability of fuel source real time driving feedback and of course the best leaving the earth better than you found it you want to get ahead of the curve this is the future um so electric vehicle use is increasing exponentially about 30% of new vehicle sales in 2030 are expected to be electric vehicles. So that would be about 55 million passenger EVs on the road, which is just awesome to think about. And according to a 2024 report, future charging infrastructure deployment announcements already sum up to the demand that we're going to have in 2030, because that's been a concern amongst people is we're not going to have enough charging infrastructure to support that. Um, also, according to the U.S. Department of Energy, as of June 2024, Florida has the second highest EV registration count preceded only by California. I was really su pleasantly surprised about this. So it's awesome. So again, environmental benefits of electric vehicles, they produce way less emissions uh, than gasoline. Um, cars, we'll talk about kind of the difference between electric, plug-in, and hybrid um, but we really need better air quality, less emissions, less greenhouse gases, especially considering 49% of those in our area come from transportation. There's lots of types of EVs too. So there's now like trucks that are on the model. There's golf carts, all sorts of different sedans and cars. There's also e-bikes. Um, so depending on, you know, your lifestyle, there are really great different diverse options for you. So here's the difference between the major types. So a conventional traditional car just uses gasoline. A hybrid car is going to use gasoline plus a little bit of battery storage. A plug-in hybrid is one you're actually going to like plug into an EV charger and that has um, more battery storage and you use a little bit of gasoline. And then all electric is no gas whatsoever. You're just plugging it in. So there's a couple of uh, buying consideration websites that I would definitely check out. And you put in information about like your daily use and other trips and um, just information about your lifestyle. And it'll give you some estimates of what type of vehicle would be good for you. So the Department of Energy has the Alternative Fuels Data Center. Um, you'll get these slides, so you'll have the link in there. Um, same thing with Pick a Plugin with the Sierra Club, also another great resource. And again, they just ask you like how many miles you're traveling. Do you have an outlet that you could use? How many seats do you need? What's your budget? Um, so it really helps narrow down the options for everyone. Oh, and this is just another screenshot of that. So we do have um, EV chargers throughout the county, and we are looking to um, install more through a third-party vendor. So we're really excited to see what the next steps are for that. Um, but we are trying our best to increase the infrastructure here in our county. Uh, there's also a lot of incentives. So there's new all-electric and plug-in hybrid vehicle tax credits through the Inflation Reduction Act. So you can get up to $7,500 tax credit for a new electric vehicle and about up to $4,000 for a used. Um, so it'll vary based on the capacity of the battery. And there is a whole entire list of very specific things that qualify. So definitely check that out. Um, talk to your tax advisor. But if you are interested in getting an EV, there are substantial tax credits that are available for this. Um, so yes, this is just more information about those tax credits. Again, definitely check out the website um, for more information, but great option for uh, those of us who are considering buying an electric vehicle. So some other ways to reduce your transportation costs and footprint include buying the most efficient vehicle that meets your needs, uh, driving your current vehicle more efficiently. So, you know, even me, I like to keep a bunch of stuff in my car because you never know. So I got like my golf clubs, my rollerblades and all these things. But, you know, that's not really driving efficient because I have a bunch of weight in my car that I don't necessarily need. So I'm really trying to downsize on that. So drive more efficiently, um, explore alternative fuels, drive less if you can, uh, carpool. Some of our interns do that. I think it's super cute. Um, you can also consider where you live and work. If you can be closer to work, uh, that would be great ride transit, you could bike or walk, depending on how safe and close it is as well. And we're going to talk about some more of those options 
with our fabulous panelists here. All right, at this point, I'm gonna pause and see if we have any questions and then we're gonna go ahead into the next one. So let me open these up. Um, is there a dial-in phone number? Um, one of uh, the other panelists, if I sent you the full like Zoom information, can you um, look at that? If not, once I stop sharing my slides or I think I'm at the end of my deck, I'll put that in the chat. So one second on that. Um, what's the plan to make 41 South more pedestrian or bike user friendly? I think that might be a question uh, for another panelist. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? Or maybe you're going to cover it in that part of your slides. Yeah, I'll touch on that when we get to the to the slides. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Bro broadly, right? So, um, yeah, but we we can we can probably more appropriate to talk about it then. Yep. Sounds good. Um, better than ice, but only solves one of the many problems. Device cars leaving space, speed danger, road damage, and storage space. It's a shame there's no tax credits for replacing a car with a bike. That would be great to have tax credits for that. You know, it's not that it's a never. So hopefully, um, that comes down the pipe at some point, but there is a lot of incentives and a lot of considerations, especially coming down from the federal government of um, incentives for electrification, not just for cars, but also for appliances and homes. And at some point they might have some for bikes, which would be super great. Okay, thank you for putting that in the chat, Patrick. Um, I think that was it for my slides. So we'll go ahead next with Miranda and I'm gonna let you take over screen sharing. And let me know if that gives you any trouble. Uh, oh, you know what? You gave me screen share. I don't have the presentation pulled up. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ali, okay. if you wouldn't mind continuing. I Not at all. Oh, well. Oh, hold on. Let that me... requires opening up a bunch of boxes. That, yes. That no, it's so usually so. not smooth when done in the middle of a presentation. So, um, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So we can, we can go on to the next slide. I'm gonna talk just uh, briefly about some differences between larger, um, more readily used trans public transportation systems and what we have here in Sarasota County. So in Sarasota County, we have a lot of people who have come to us from the Northeast where public transit is a way of life. And in those areas, as well as other parts of the world, um, mass, mass transportation, typically works well in historic densely populated urban cores where you have a high volume of people in a concentrated area. Additionally, where they have developed with road, sorry, grid road networks. Um, and uh, especially in that Northeast where your cities are actually blending together to get that megalopolis. Um, and so you don't necessarily notice when you're moving from one municipality into the next. And with those factors combined, transit is often more convenient than driving, so they have a spectrum of users on their public transportation systems. Here in Sarasota County, we were primarily developed um, in the automotive era from the 1950s and on. So as you take a look at that housing structures that we have, most of them have a garage, if not a two car or three car garage. So there's a mindset that um, single occupancy vehicles are a way of life in Sarasota County. And in addition, um, we have fewer grid road networks and more large private developments that have adopted meandering roadways to help calm traffic um, with cul-de-sacs and other traffic patterns that make it more difficult for easy escape, which is a crime prevention technique. Um, however, those pieces don't combine well for public transportation because we have a large development such as Palmer Ranch, uh, and even a gated community, then transportation is able to get to the front of that development. However, if an individual still has to walk three miles from their house to the entrance of the development, then it's not working very well for that individual. We also have multiple municipalities that are separated by waterways and by undeveloped land. So um, on the screen is our system map. Within the system map, you can see, let's say down at the bottom, two yellowish blob areas. And not a lot of, uh, that's the city of Venice and the Northport area, not their exact municipal boundaries, but in between those and the Northern Sarasota County area, you can see that we have kind of some empty spaces. And so connecting our municipalities is much less efficient here than it would be in an area where your municipalities are running together because we need to take our transportation through undeveloped areas where there are very few pickups and drop-offs. 
Then with our um, areas separated by waterways, if traffic is not moving on the bridge, then we are not moving on the bridge either. So that just is one um, additional reason that uh, we're, we're lacking some incentive for public transportation here in Sarasota County. And all of that combined means that at this point, for most people, driving is more convenient than taking public transportation. So our goal at Breeze Transit is to identify individuals for which public transportation may make sense as a lifestyle choice, at least on certain occasions, to try to attract that spectrum of users, recognizing that our system will not work for everybody on every trip. But we are targeting um, four groups because we feel that they are most likely to consider public transportation as opposed to just needing public transportation. So our target groups are uh, leisure seniors. We have um, a large population of seniors in Sarasota County. And so when they're heading out to uh, meet a friend to go shopping or dining, typically there's a flexible schedule there and we encourage public transit for those opportunities. We have three colleges on US 41 and arrangements with those colleges for students to ride free. So those are an ideal target audience for us. Additionally, our low-income families um, who may be struggling, 86% uh, of Sarasota County households have two or more vehicles. So if we can assist some of those vehicle, some of those households in reducing to one vehicle plus public transportation, we would consider that a win for both parties. And then finally, tourists as a targeted audience. We have over 3 million tourists coming to Sarasota County every year, with a quarter of them arriving without a car. And so um, providing a public transportation system that connects the predictable destinations, such as hotels, beaches, shopping, um, and our theaters, uh, we would consider that a win for both the tourists as well as our public transportation system. So that's a lot of information um, going through on just one main slide of what does public transportation look like and why in Sarasota County. So Leah, if I could get, actually don't switch yet. So this system map is showing that we have a hybrid system. The colorful lines represent our routes, which are traditional fixed routes or bus routes and trolley routes. And then the yellow um, shaded areas represent our breeze on demand zones, which is a mobility on demand also called a demand response curb to curb service. So I'm gonna talk about those two different services and in Sarasota County, your, the service that you would use is primarily based on your geographic location, which is why the map is my starting point. So, okay, Ali, if you wouldn't mind going on to our next slide, which is about our Breeze routes. So we kept our routes, uh, we transitioned to a hybrid system in 2021, and we kept our routes on our most heavily traveled corridors because um, where we have a lot of people going in the same direction, that makes sense for us to provide a large vehicle and a schedule. This works better for riders who have routine trips because they can align their trips to the schedule of the service. Uh, it also works well for connecting multimodal riders. Many of our routes intersect with um, bicycle pedestrian pathways and also connecting our inner city riders. Um, so from the city of Sarasota to the city of Venice, one would take one of our, um, our routes, it would be our Route 17, or from the city of Venice to the city of Northport would be our Route 9 connecting them. And I believe, Ilya, if we click again, then I should have some service uh, details. So our routes uh, run Monday through Saturday, 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., with some routes running on Sundays as well. The Breeze Rider website and the Breeze Rider mobile app are the two locations to plan your trips. You can enter your starting and ending locations. And if there is a route nearby those locations, then that website will generate which route and at what times you can catch it. Our cost or our fare is $1.50 per ride. Uh, unlimited 30 day ride passes are also available for $50. Additional details are that in Sarasota County, age 65 and over, or those with a qualifying disability or a Medicare car, Hard ride for 75 cents and age 80 and over and five and under ride our buses for free. All right. For our on-demand service, it's the next slide. So we have Breeze on demand in areas with less identifiable travel patterns. Um, this is really popular in our Northport area as well as our Venice Inglewood area where you don't have those main um, corridors and you have less of that grid system. 
And so um, people are going all over those areas, not necessarily on the same road and in the same direction. This also works well for writers who have a more flexible schedule because it is an on-demand service. So when an individual is ready to take a trip, they would enter their starting and ending location into the Breeze On Demand app or website, um, or they can call our Breeze On Demand phone number. And then if a vehicle is available within 30 minutes, they would receive a confirmation that the vehicle's on their way along with an estimated wait time, the license plate number of the vehicle, and the driver's name of the vehicle. And then when the vehicle arrives, of course, they can double check all that information to be sure that they're getting into um, a trusted van. And now our vans are all branded like you can see on the slide. So it's pretty easy to tell if the car that just pulled up is the car that you requested. One additional fact about our Breeze On Demand service is that because it is public transportation, our Breeze On Demand drivers are subject to the same requirements as our bus drivers, which means they are all background checked and subject to random drug and test, um, drug and substance abuse screening. Uh, and then Aliyah, one more click. And our service is for Breeze On Demand, Monday through Saturday, 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., Sunday, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is a shared ride service that's very important. Um, it's different from an Uber or Lyft because with an Uber or Lyft, you can get direct service with you as the only passenger in the vehicle. With Breeze On Demand, other passengers may be picked up or dropped off along the way, which is where the public piece of this public transportation comes into play. And with that in mind, it may not be the most direct trip to your destination, but it will be a trip to your destination. Um, and with that, it is $2 per person. You can book a ride for up to four people. So at $2 per person, if you booked a ride for four passengers, that would be an $8 trip. Um, and then our, our routes connect our on-demand zones. So I mentioned someone traveling from Northport to Venice would ride the Route 9, but they could get to the Route 9 by using Breeze On Demand. So there would be a transfer required from the on-demand service to the route and vice versa at the other end. And then we have a couple other services. Ali, if I could get one more slide, there we go. Um, I mentioned that we were targeting visitors or tourists as one of our audiences. We do have two services that work well for our visitors. One is the 76 Flyer. That is a trolley that travels from the SRQ airport to eight hotels in downtown Sarasota with no stops in between. That is $2 and it is equipped with a luggage rack. So we're very excited to have launched that service this February. Additionally, we have a 77 Siesta Islander trolley that travels on Siesta Key from the north end at Siesta Village all the way to the south end at Turtle Beach. And that is a free trolley service for anybody who chooses to board. Our third service branch is our Breeze Plus Paratransit. That's an eligibility-based program, specifically for individuals with qualifying disabilities or with an age over 65 and a low income who or low income who have no other transportation available to them. And getting into the details of that is um, a little tricky without having more visuals and we're trying to keep this short and focused on the main ideas of how to ride public transportation for the general public. But if anyone is interested in that paratransit program, I would be more than happy to provide some additional information. As well, we can talk in much more detail about our transportation services um, some of our goals for the department, some of our history, where we're going, where we're at. Um, so if anyone on this call is interested in learning more about public transportation with a separate presentation, I would be happy to oblige that request. And that is all of my slides. I think the next one says questions. All right, I'm opening up the chat. Um, we have a question. Will you be adding more bus stops with shade, trees, and seating along heavily traveled routes? I see many riders standing waiting in the full sun. So as far as the shade trees go, I don't believe that's been um, uh, explored recently. So I could go to a response that I heard years back when I was not part of the transit system, but since that's not a current topic, um, I will say that we have much more conversation about installing additional shelters to provide shade. And the biggest obstacle that we face for installing shelters is um, getting 
permission. So whether that's uh, acquiring right of way or acquiring an easement from the property owner, and then also um, going through the permitting process. Uh, the, the shelter itself is actually the really easy part. We can buy shelters. I don't want to say we can buy shelters all day long, but in comparison to how much work it is to actually get the piece of property and go through the engineering and design and permitting, since it does have to still meet hurricane standards, um, that's our biggest obstacle. So we definitely are working on it, and we, I believe, are getting ready to um, solicit a new contract for additional shelters. But the, like I said, the shelters are less difficult than actually getting permission from the community to place them. So we're working on it is the shortest answer. <laughs> All right. And then we had a second question. Um, might be worth mentioning that fixed group breeze fares are cash only. So come prepared and passes must be purchased at either Venice train station or downtown transfer station only. Is that accurate? Yep. That is absolutely accurate. We are a cash only system. Um, in lieu of cash, it is the 30-day unlimited ride pass, or we do have individuals who could potentially pay $20 on the bus, receive a change card, and then use that change voucher, which is still a paper ticket to pay down the rest of um, their rides in the near future. All righty. That was the only questions that I saw, Patrick. I think you mentioned taking over for yourself. Uh, no, I think I don't. I'm like Miranda. I don't have it up. I thought I could just virtually take it over. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I will have you do it. And we're going to be jumping back and forth. I'm just reviewing my slides and I think I put some in the wrong order. So we're going to we're going to see how this goes. But um, you can go to the next slide and I'll just introduce myself to everybody. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Patrick, Patrick Louie. I am the Bicycle Pedestrian Trails Coordinator for Sarasota County. So my role here is um, I'm a planner, an urban planner. Um, I'm a public work, so I'm surrounded by engineers. Um, but my role here as, as the planner um, for this type of uh, mode of transportation is to plan um, the infrastructure for bicycling and walking and getting around from using alternative modes. So we include bike lanes, um, trail systems in, the, in our right-of-way sidewalks and things like that and then the other side of my position is it's more what I call the softer side of it is the, the education and encouragement component of uh, um, bicycle and pedestrian planning so we try to encourage people to get out of their cars um, explain the rules of the road um, things like that right so there's the planning infrastructure infrastructure side and there's sort of the human behavior aspect of it, getting people to do these things more often um in a safe manner so that's my role here um what you see here these two pictures i have are um kind of our guidelines or uh, uh, the basis for how we plan our trail systems and our bicycle pedestrian plans these are our master plans you can find them on our website at scgov.net um just do a quick search for them if you actually want a full link you could just email me and i will um send them to you my email is there on the screen um but basically it just kind of outlines our, our networks and things like that and I, I am going to get into that so the next slide Aaliyah. Um, so this is, our, I mean, basically put, you know, this is a lot of words to say, hey, we, we want to build a network that's safe, efficient, that people want to use, right? When we want to prioritize walking and biking um, in those forms and, and connect meaningful places that people want to go to. Uh, I think we've really, I've been with the county here for 10 years. Um, and when they created my position, there was, there was no, nobody dedicated to looking at bicycle pedestrian planning. Um, so, you know, the county has really changed um, over the last decade in terms of prioritizing these things, right? And it takes time, right? It takes, it takes foundations of building policies and plans and getting funding and, and getting it in the conscious mind of developers and, and our elected officials that, hey, bicycle pedestrian stuff matters, right? So we, we've been building that. And you can, I think if you look back over time, you can really see the progression of how we've been doing that in Sarasota County. So um, really, you know, We've done a lot of great things. We still need to do great things, but um, we are on that upward trend of uh, doing that. So, Alia, you can next slide, please. Okay. So, part of the whole evolution of of bicycle pedestrian planning is, you know, what our residents want and what they've been telling us over these last 10 years I've been here. And, you know, with those two master plans I mentioned, we did a lot of public input and and, and and the public involvement. And, you know, so when we did those plans, the biggest things that we got from, from that was that people wanted separated facilities. They wanted wider sidewalks. They wanted to fill gaps. We have an incomplete transportation network. 
It was very important to people to have low stress um, facilities. So we're not talking about like, um, you know, on busy roads, they wanted separation, right? Right now, you know, the old way to build a bike lane was be a four foot bike lane, right? That was, you know, that was sufficient at the time. But as, as transportation patterns change, people wanted to get off the road more. They wanted wider facilities, things like that, right? So, you know, these are the things we we're hearing. They wanted to focus on major roadways and intersections. And, you know, we talked about um, shade and all that and previously with transit. They want shade and lighting on our bike lanes and our trails, right? So, uh, you know, we're listening to the people and we want to we want to build the facilities that people want to use because we want them to use, right? And then you can see there the graphic there where we talk about the population that we're serving in terms of riders, right? You, you have, you know, the biggest bang for our buck that we can sort of target is that interested but concerned group, right? That's 51 to 50. 6% of the total population, people who are thinking about trying it might want to try it. You know, we want to provide them the facilities and, and the knowledge to be able to do that and do it confidently and safely. Right. Of course we have, you know, we're planning for everybody, right? So we have road users. We want to address that too. But when we think about the County overall and the people who are thinking about using it and are, will really elevate um, bike bed transportation, it's really that 51 to 56% that is like, is the one we really got to, um, push to the next level. So next slide, please. Okay, so when we're talking about those networks and our master plans, you know, all when you're looking through there, we're going to be looking at priorities and, and planning networks and where are we building the next um, set of infrastructures and, and targeting areas. Uh, right now, uh, you know, you can see on this particular plan, we've, we've grouped like projects in tiers, right? So uh, we had a set of criteria. We're doing our plans like 14 different criteria. So like safety, um, connectivity, um, uh, right of way. I can't remember what they all were, but there were a lot. Um, and those priorities, when we look at our quarters and our needs, we sort of come up with this plan over the next, you know, we're going to update this plan in the next couple of years. So this might, this will look different. So, but now we have a roadmap for, hey, where are the areas we need to target that kind of need some improvement? Um, so Ali, I'm going to have you go to the next slide. Um, can you go to, okay, go one more, and then we're going to come back to this. Okay, so just in sort of table format, right? This is kind of what we're looking at. So this is just, I just took a, a snippet out of the master plan. So you can see where we identify corridors and their limits and what kind of gaps they have, um, what the opportunities are. So, you know, this is just sort of the, the narrative underneath the layer of the lines you see on the map, what that looks like. So now, Ali, if you go back, um, to the slide before. So we talk about what kind of facilities are we talking about, right? So, and this isn't, these aren't all the facilities. This is the type of, of facilities that um, are commonly used in, you know, at the state level and, be, and from a best practice point of view. So we have shared lanes, we have bicycle boulevards or shares, you might've seen that where you're using essentially on a low speed road, sharing that facility. We have buffered bike lanes um, that people want more separation on, separated bike lanes, even if there's opportunities to do that and more use of um, side paths and shared use paths. So that'll come into play a little later when we talk, but uh, okay, Leah, um, let's jump forward to the next slide. Okay, excuse me, let me get a quick drink, check the time. Okay, so um, one of the things I wanted to touch base with you on um, is just some of the projects that we're doing and how exciting it is to even be thinking and planning about bicycle pedestrian stuff. So, you know, I, you know, I apologize this, you probably need more of a, local knowledge of the area to really understand this. But what I'm showing you here is um, um, a trail alignment, right? So, and Catherine's gonna talk about the Legacy Trail um, when she gets there. And, and but we, what we've been trying to do is make connections from the Legacy Trail. And the Legacy Trail real briefly is a is a trail on an old rail corridor that really is our spine trail, connects our municipalities in our county. And what you see here is an alignment that we've shifted um, in, over the past year um, to sort of connect the neighborhoods and areas that are um, within the state Sun Trail network. This this path used to go up like in a, in a weird way up um, up 41 and and connect um, to Manatee County up by closer Pasa Airport and things like that. But as we went through like stakeholder involvement and finding out where these connections were going to be, we sort of realigned that path. So that blue line there. Um, that's sort of shifted over to more to the yellow line, which is Beneva. But the point is, this is coming off the Legacy Trail, the northern extension. And this is a way where we connect regionally from Sarasota County to Manatee County. So we've, we've been working with the MPO 
which is our regional planning partner, Met Metropolitan Planning Organization, the city of Sarasota, the state to realign the segment. So you can see the exciting part is that purple line, it goes up Bobby Jones Golf Course, and it's going to go through um, the 17th Street Regional Park. Um, it's going to go through Honoré Nathan Benderson, and then it's going to go over the interstate through Lakewood Ranch and up to Lorraine Road and connect to Manatee County. It's going to be great. Um, but these are sort of the things we're doing in terms of thinking about where people want to go and the facilities they want to use. Okay, next slide, Aaliyah. So just the snippet here, we talked about people saying, hey, we want we want wider facilities, we want off-road, we want to connect to places of interest. This is more of a, I'm sort of zooming in here to the part that we're really planning to do. So that 17th Street there, park, that's a redevelopment. The, the parks and natural resources redeveloping that to a regional park. You know, it's going to be a destination park. Um, the city, um, if you look down to the lower left, they're redeveloping Bobby Jones, right? So that whole area is going to be connected and, and new and people are going to want to go there. And you can see there here as part of this system on the Green Line and 17th Street, we're planning to do shared use path on the north side connecting to Honoré, going north to Nathan Menderson Park. You can get to Nathan Menderson Park on the backside of Honoré through the south and it's going to connect it to that park, that park hosts um rowing events all kinds of like um community events it's just a it's just a hub for where people want to go so next slide so when we're thinking big picture and like man these possibilities so this is the project here that is uh what you see is a conceptual design of an overpass over i-75 because nathan benderson park where the water is actually is, is divided by um i-75 and the other side is lakewood ranch right people you know we're developing the lakewood ranch the communities there are building wider facilities so this is just sort of like a big picture thing where we've done the design of it it's almost i think it might be done now we're trying to get construction funding for it but you see the pieces aligning where we are building like these big big pieces of infrastructure to connect our communities so um it's fun and exciting so uh next slide please okay so we talked about this is kind of going back to the question in the chat um, and we're working on, right now we have a grant, we got a grant from the Federal um, Highway Administration called the Safe Streets for All Grant. And this grant is going to allow us to um, analyze our entire road network in all of Sarasota County. So local roads, thoroughfare roads, and it's going to involve all the municipalities. So right now we are actively, we have a consultant on to do this. We have a grant from um to do this project. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all the crash data in the county. We're gonna look at 41, we're gonna look at Fruitville, we're gonna look at all the roads, we're gonna look at where the crashes are, and we're gonna be able to come up with a plan to have mitigation strategies um, to improve those intersections, those roadways. Um, so it's not only bike ped, but this, the whole um, study is also gonna look at vehicular improvements, right? So how do cars move through intersections? Um, how do we reduce, you know, rear ends and head-on collisions with vehicles? And then also in that component is how do we improve bike pad, right? So we're looking at that whole network. And then once we have this plan done, which should be done next year in 25, we can apply for implementation funds. And that's the most important part, right? Because funding is always comes down to funding. We can apply for implementation funds to do those things. Um, so that's really exciting because that's the funding opportunities is really important. So next slide, Aaliyah. Um, next slide, we'll come back to this one. <laughs> okay, so what are some of these uh, uh, improvements we're talking about, right? So these are just some options, right? We're talking about, and I've kind of just hired bike head stuff. Like I said, it's gonna come into the vehicular part, but you know, you could see here is a different way to build an intersection, right? Um, where you can have like a bike lane coming through an intersection that's protected, right? And you're making the bump outs at the curb. So it's like uh, lowering the radius for, um, or cars have to, or increasing the radius for cars at the turn. So it's just a safer type of intersection. We see the use of green markings here, right? This is something that our department recently approved for us to do. We're looking at opportunities to fit this in where we can do it. Of course, we have to look at what's the pricing, what's the maintenance, but before we didn't really, you know, there wasn't really an appetite to try this, but now we're really on that path of doing that, right? So that's new and exciting. And of course, we're looking at crossings, you know, where are people crossing, how are they doing that safely? So this whole grant is going to be able to give us more of a um, opportunity to look at these things, implement these projects. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. Okay, so let's go back another slide. Let me check my time here. Okay, so the other thing we're working on, and I've had a great, uh, every year we hire um, a, a set of interns. I have a great group working on this for me this year. We are really focusing on micromobility. Micromobility is, you know, it's very aligns with this whole topic we're talking about. Ali was talking about sustainability. How do we get people out of their cars? How are people getting around, right? So, um, you know, the biggest 
trend that we're seeing in, in transportation and alternative transportation is the is micro mobility e bikes e scooters things like that and I think the reality is of it is that our the way we used to build infrastructure sort of surpassed this technology right they're going at higher speeds we need places for them to go we need a policy to find out you know where should they be allowed where should they be allowed so we're working on that uh, it's not completed yet but you know we've been benchmarking with some of our other municipalities so this is just some micro mobility stats by the numbers um, you know some municipalities have age restrictions some of them restrict them on sidewalks things like that um and so we're just kind of figuring out what should go where um so we're working through that and um but we know that it is a trend that people are using people want to use this more it's getting people out there so we need to find like what's the middle ground between the way we design things and and how we should have people interact and how do we educate them on that okay so let's jump uh two slides over so let's just talk about some community events real quick and I'll wrap it up here because um, it is important for us to encourage people and do things that and encourage people to be aware of bikes and, and be out there and try things. So this is one event we did this year. Um, Miranda was out there with us um, as a breeze representative. You can see the breeze bus back there. But this was a, um, a bike from work day event that we had in National Bike Month in May. And what we did was we organized a ride around the city, a, a guided ride. Um, we had an event where people came, they could come to the breeze bus, try put their bike on the rack. We are giving out safety gear. Those people there on the left, we fitted them with helmets, um, doing bike pet education. We just went on a guided ride, right? So it was, uh, it was uh, just a way to encourage riders and have people in their vehicles, just see people riding more um, and expect them to be there. So that's, that's one um, type of event we do in order to encourage this stuff. So Aliyah, next slide. And then recently, we've been working with uh, um, the Florida Department of Health to do this um, ongoing event down in Inglewood, um, and it's it's a bike repair event. It happens on the first Tuesday of every month down at St. David's um, Church and the Jubilee Center. And the whole basis for this was that um, there's a lot of uh, population that's unhoused in that area, and the unhoused use bikes and, and they walk to get everywhere. Um, so the purpose of this clinic is that they can bring their bikes to this, this, uh, this place every Tuesday of every month and get their bikes repaired and fixed. Um, all, not only that, anybody can come and do that, not just the unhoused population, but you can come and do that. We offer that as a service. We have technicians who are there to fix your bike, but not only that, we take bikes, we repurpose them, we fix them up, and then we do redistribute them to the, the people that need them. So we started this program about a year ago, right? Um, and since that year, and what was a year in February or no, it was a year from March. And in that time from 23 to 24, I think we serviced around, um, a hundred bikes and we gave out 80 of them. Right. So, um, you know, small steps, right. But that's a lot. That's, those are bikes that people are using now and getting repaired and doing it safely. So, you know, that's an opportunity for us to give them bike lights and do outreach. So anyway, just wanted to highlight that. I think that's a really great program we started. So with that, I will um, take questions or concede my time to Catherine. Let me open up the chat. Um, okay where are the first bike boxes going in they are great on the pictures in many intersections around the county that will benefit from them yeah um don't know yet that's a uh, um well well we do know actually um okay so in the city we do have them on ring Ringling Boulevard, right? So if you want to see them in use right now, go to Ringling. They did a whole street transformation there. It's great. It's beautiful. People love it. Um, the bikers love it. Some cars don't love it. <laughs> so, but it's it's really great for if you're a biker. Um, I know that I need to catch up. Some FDOT is implementing them on some of their interchange designs. So I think now this might have changed. So, uh, but I, I remember the B Ridge um, intersection. I remember when they when they're doing that one. I remember green bike lanes going up to the limits. We had asked them to do that. That could have changed. Um, locally, um, we've had some requests to look at um, some areas for green bike boxes, and we're still understanding what the um, what maybe the engineering side of it is. Like the sometimes you know in this world of of uh, planning, we have to justify things, but with an engineering warrant, right? So crosswalks and and lights and things like that, we have to have an engineering basis for it. Uh, I think we're we're planning them whenever we have what we call um, um, e hole lanes, which is where you have a turning lane, a bike lane, and then a lane beside it, kind of sandwiched in between. 
Um, FDOT guidelines are to really use green bike lanes in those areas where they're high emphasis, right, where there might be crossing. So there are specific areas where we want to do it. We don't know where um, the next one's going to be. They are coming, um, but, you know, it's on a site by case by case basis. All right, we have another question. I really like the overpass idea, and I'm wondering um, if there is any possibility for sustainable transportation options and increased safety at crossings to also benefit wildlife crossing busy roads too. Um, maybe. Um, I don't want to say no. I don't think we've have come across that on our public roads. I mean, I think that when we plan trails on our actual areas, we'll work with our parks department. Or I think that's probably where you'll see the benefit of, of wildlife crossing more in, I would say, the eastern parts. Uh, for a public works perspective, we're really focusing on our roadway network, right? Um, so I haven't really, you know, I've seen those concepts in, in other parts of the country where we have wildlife crossings, like over overpasses, things like that. We haven't really talked about that yet, but, um, you know, most of our focus is on on street and getting people across. But um, when we start developing in the more nat natural areas where we're maybe doing a natural path, I think that's something we want to think about. I know in one case in the Mayakachi Environmental Creek Park, years ago, we, we built a bridge for equestrians, right? So people were riding their horses and going back there. That's not necessarily wildlife per se. Those are domesticated horses with riders. But we wanted to build that infrastructure so that people could actually get over there because they were going to go see um, wildlife, right? So it's, it's all things that we're looking at together in, in holistically. Awesome. Uh, we had another comment. Yes, please. On the green paint bike from work mm -hmm. day was great. People who never tried urban cycling gave it a go. Mm -hmm. We have a decent taste of what it's like. We also had some people say thank you and that it's wonderful. That's awesome that you're doing that. There are bike lanes on Ringling, but I'm not aware of any boxes there. Right. Correct. Know? Correct. Okay, yep. where the bikes accumulate in front of the cars waiting for lights to change. Yep. yep. And then we have one more. There's so much focus on leisure riders, but those who ride to work need safe ways to get around, especially on 41. That yeah. And yeah, and that 41, basically that back to that safe streets for all thing. We're gonna analyze those networks. That's a those are state roads. We rely on the state to um to really lead those projects. Uh, there have been a number of improvements on US 41 that where they've increased the bike lanes, the seven foot buffered bike lanes. It's a little bit segmented right now. We're always working, completing those gaps, but there there have been some major improvements on 41 in the past few years. Probably not in the areas that you're talking about though, I would imagine. So we are looking at that. All right. Well, that was all we had in the chat box. Uh, we'll have more opportunity for questions at the end. So we'll go ahead and let Catherine go ahead with her part. Hang on. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I mute and unmute and then mute and unmute again and it works. <laughs> So I am the trails manager for Sarasota County Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources. And I manage, you can go to the next slide, slide Aaliyah, um, with my contact information. Um, I manage the Legacy Trail, the Venetian Waterway Park, both the east and west side, and the Northport Connector, along with everything in between. So um, there's contact information, like you're going to get that at the end of this, all slides be sent to you. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can go to the next one. So the legacy trails, you know, like Patrick said, is like the spine that runs through Sarasota County. It's um, 18 miles, the legacy trail that runs north south with a little bit of east west in there as well. Uh, it's an incredible county asset um, for alternative transportation. Um, the, the legacy trail, the main part of it goes from Venice train depot to Payne park. It's an asphalt paved rail to trail, um, that is managed by us and it's about 12 to 14 feet wide. So there's plenty of room. Hours are 6 AM to sunset with plenty of stop stations. There's bike repair stations, trailheads throughout. Um, travels through and connects a lot of our communities through Sarasota County and the city of Sarasota, city of Venice and Northport. So it goes through a lot of our natural areas and our urban areas and connects those communities for sure. Um, like I said, the Venetian Waterway Park is, is 
eight, about eight miles, both on the east and west side. It's a concrete path that is about 10 feet wide, same hours as the Legacy Trail, and it travels along the east and west side of the Intercoastal Waterway. And we work alongside with the Intercoastal Waterway, WCIND, and the City of Venice to manage that um, part of the trail. And it also connects directly up with the Legacy Trail at the Venice Train Depot. Um, so we see about 600 to 675,000 um, users on the trail each year, and it's growing. Um, we're seeing more and more people. Um, and like I said, it's a great connection um, for the park um, and the community. The Northport Connector, um, I believe it's on my next slide. You can go ahead and move to the next one. Um, nope, it's trailheads. So the Northport Connector goes out further east to the um, towards the Carlton Reserve and then heads through Deer Prairie Creek and connects up um, with Northport. And oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we'll go back to that other one. Um, and I'll bounce around like Patrick does. You can go back one. So along the Legacy Trail, these are from north to south. The uh, trailheads offer a lot of different amenities, including restrooms and pavilions and playgrounds. There's drinking water there. There's um, some of the trailheads have walking paths. Osprey Junction Trailhead has a visitor center that's seasonally opened uh, along with some formal master garden gardens and some trails. And so it's not just the legacy trail that we're connecting. We're connecting a lot of these parks and trailheads. Um, there's some bike repair stations at the trailheads as well, but they're scattered throughout the entire length of the Legacy Trail and Venetian Waterway, along with a lot of shaded benches and stop stations. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else. There's, on some of the trailheads, we're starting to actually make our pavilions that are there reservable. So you can have birthday parties and guaranteed space. Um, but the trailheads are often smaller in size. Um, so you're not going to be able to have a huge event there. Um, but that's the things we're looking down the road. We do some small events at the trailheads as well. A lot of kids activities, some nature crafts. So it's all again, connecting to that community. Um, now you can go to the next one. <laughs> so the Northern extension, which is from Culver house trailhead up to Payne park and, and ending at Fruitville road. Um, that was a big push that we had done um, in, in 18, 19, and 20, 21, those big segments. Um, I'm not going to read from the slides, but that was voted by over 70% um, to extend the Legacy Trail and including that Northport connector. Um, the map there shows the Northport connector, and it also... Um, includes the South Powerline Trail and the Elk that goes through the Carlton Reserve and the Alphabet Trail that goes north-south to Deer Prairie Creek. So those are three major connections to Northport. Um, and that's been open for about two years, both the extension and the Northport connector. Um, Can I hijack you for a second? Go ahead. <laughs> that, that South Pole Line Trail, that's See out at Mayakachi Creek Environmental Park. That's where I was talking about where that bridge is, where we did the the equestrian crossing. So just to give you some context of, of where that is, and the Carlton Reserve, there people go there and and look at gators and 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 birds and things like that. So um, that's just it tickled my brain about the wildlife. <laughs> question, like a, so thank yeah. you. All right. right, there it is. And if you have not been on the Northport Connector, it is. Um, we've had Bobcat, we recently had a bear roaming both on north and spot of north and south side of I-75. So it's somehow making its way through. I'm not sure where, but um, we've had a black bear come through spotted very recently. Um, I actually had a Bobcat um, run through my office here at Osprey Junction Trailhead and had a Bobcat run through here. So um, lots of different wildlife opportunities along the trail. Um, a lots of gopher tortoises, but you know, you never know what you're going to see. Um, so where was I on 
Yes, 2022, we opened up those three brand new trailheads, Sarasota Springs, Pompano, and the Northport Connector, um, the connections to Northport. And then for the future, we are, Patrick already touched on the extension that can will connect up to uh, Manatee County. That route is pretty close to be set in stone. We're still not 100% on some of those connections, but that'll be in the near future. Uh, also possibly having an additional connections down to warm mineral springs. Um, our major construction on the legacy trail and to help with the flow of, of traffic and safety as our bridges overpasses. So if you haven't been through town, Clark Road and Bee Ridge bridges are currently under construction with the future bridges. Um, the next two will be Beneva and Bay of Vista. And then hopefully a project starting in early 2025 will be a widening of the trail. So it'll be a bifurcated trail, a little separate trail um, side by side from Beneva to Shade is phase one and phase two and three will connect it all the way down to uh, Ashton Trailhead and that will have two separate lanes, one for walkers to keep um, younger kids and families onto that slower section per se of the trail and then have the um, rest of the trail for your day-to-day -day, um, trail users. And you can go to the next one. So the biggest challenge in Patras Patrick kind of touched on it already too, is just trying to have the etiquette and rules of the trail and trail safety is very important to us. Um, and we have signs posted and we try to educate the public as much as we can. Um, you know, that it's probably one of the number one complaint that I get is there's speeders on the trail, um, but speed limit is 15 miles per hour. You're um, always should wear a helmet. Uh, warn before passing, passing left in single file, just, you know, warn that you're passing, um, trying not to block the trail and always stop and using those crossing signals at intersections are very important for everyone's safety and just being courteous to others. Um, of course, on the trail, it's a shared use trail. You'll see um, bicycles, E-bikes are allowed on the trail, um, but motorized vehicles are not. Um, and so like we are working through language on, on rules and everything, just like how Patrick had touched on already as well. Um, I think that's all I've got, unless there's questions. Yeah, that is it. We are right at one. So I apologize for running yep. behind. We'll take questions for anybody who wants to stay on. If we're not able to answer your question, we'll definitely um, email you back if you just let us know. We do have ways to get involved. You'll get these slides. So I'm not going to go over those. I do want to get some time for questions in here. We also have some more resources available for folks. But I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat box in the interest of time. And we'll start from the top. Uh, I forget where we started. OK, I think it's here. Um, so that was great information and well thought out. I will pass it to our environmental groups, the Florida Environmental Film Festival sponsors, a meetup group called Florida Adventures and Explorers. Thank you so much for getting our information out there. We're always happy to um, educate and do some outreach. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Miranda, for putting that in the chat. We also had a comment. Please consider expanding hours of these vital transportation conduits, closing at dark forces cyclists onto busy roads at the worst time, office commuters in winter and server workers year round into or run into this. So of course, we're always trying to make it better. I know we're doing those plans. Um, so that's something that I'm certainly they'll factor into that. Um, so power line and alpha. Alphabet are gravel, dirt. New users might want to know that. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, time had to leave early. Will you be adding trees closer to the trails? It's so hot to ride during the summer without shade. That one I'm not sure of. Does anyone want to take that? I don't do trail stuff. 
Catherine, I think you're muted. You might have to mute, unmute, mute. I don't know. Holy, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's so weird. I hadn't touched my mute, unmute button. <laughs> um, so it's the shade on trail uh, right on the trail is a catch 22 because we all want to be in shade, but the roots of those trees break up the trail immensely and will pop concrete on the Venetian waterway. And we have been, you know, we get cut tree roots constantly. Um, so we try not to have vegetation growing right up next to the trail. Um, and it, you know, we are, we do plant some trees, um, but they're not going to be directly next to the trail just for that reason. Okay. Pinellas Trail has some bifurcated sections like Catherine mentioned. They are nice for reducing stress on particularly heavy traveled sections. Thanks for that. Great presentation. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you to the presenters. I came across this presentation through the Sarasota Mobility Alliance. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we'll definitely check that out. I don't see anything else in the chat. So if there's any last minute questions, feel free to throw those in right now. Um, or you can unmute yourself. But if not, thank you again for your time today. I hope you learned something new. If you think of any questions, just follow up with us. I will be sending out these slides in just a little bit. Um, but have a good rest of your day. Thank you again.